we cannot leave any opportunity to participate and make sure that we are represented in a decision-making process on the table. So that means being involved in protests and demonstration, but also being involved in neighborhood work, being involved in, in, in legislative work, uh, being counted in the census, voting in every election, all the way up and down the ballot. Uh, joining me now is Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist. Garland, it's good to see you. I, I've got to ask you, how would you describe what we're seeing here in the country and in Michigan in this past week and a half? Well, Chrissy, thank you for having me. You know, what we're seeing is this collective, this exhausted primordial scream from communities across the country, particularly Black communities across this country who are just yearning for justice, yearning for access to opportunity, and just just constantly dismayed when we see another life taken unnecessarily, unjustifiably, and in a way that was completely preventable, but that is um, unfortunately the culmination or just yet another culminating point of the years of prejudice and structural racism that has led to the dismissive, um, dismissive treatment of black people and black bodies. So I think that's what you're hearing and seeing in communities across our state and, and across the country. Um, I think people are stepping up and needing to, to feel like their voices, uh, they need to shout louder so their voices can be heard. And, and I think those demonstrations, frankly, are warranted. You've been very active on social media and, and Twitter and Facebook and speaking directly, saying, I hear you, I see you. You've also been at some of the protests. What are people telling you um, and being able to reach people directly? Well, I think it's important to go where people are. That's my job as a public servant, to go where they are, to listen, and to make sure that we can ultimately uh, use this office uh, to be responsive to people's needs. And so when I was on the west side of Detroit, um, so what I saw was a group of young people who were ready for change and who were hungry, who were ready to be engaged. And so my, my message to them was that we cannot leave any decision-making opportunity on the table. We cannot leave any opportunity to participate and make sure that we are represented in a decision-making process on the table. So that means being involved in protests and demonstration, but also being involved in neighborhood work being involved in, in, in legislative work, uh, being counted in the census, voting in every election all the way up and down the ballot. Um, that's what we need. And then we need to be involved in the accountability mechanism for public officials going forward. How can we design the right types of policy solutions that we want to see from law enforcement, whether it's uh, more civilian oversight, uh, different use of force protocols, uh, better, more training when it comes to de-escalation or implicit bias or um, or, or recruitment of more diverse officers that look like the community or more investment in community policing. These are the sorts of things that people want to see. And so my message is let's work together to make it happen. Do you feel like you've had these conversations over and over and over again? Um, and then how do you plan on taking your office as the highest ranking black official in the state of Michigan? Now you have the racial disparities task force coming out of the COVID-19 crisis. How do you plan to shape that into policy that we can address the inequities here? Yeah, unfortunately, this has been a conversation for my entire life. Like, I mean, I got I got pulled over unjustifiably for going 24 to 25 when I was on my way to high school in Farmington, for example, just because of what I looked like. So, you know, I, I understand that this is a problem that has existed, and it rhymes with the issues that we're seeing with the with the coronavirus when it comes to uh, Black people being disproportionately impacted, in part because um, we live in places that ha have an environment that is more poisonous, in part because we live in places where uh, we have less access to the healthcare system. And so what I'm trying to do um, in this position with the support of Governor Gresham Whitmer is working to make sure that we, we can have policies that are actually responsive, that we can make sure that um, the equitable investments in education and healthcare infrastructure are being made and directed so that we can make sure that we can respond specifically and say, you know what, testing accessibility is the front door to treatment for vulnerable populations. So that's why we stood up almost 30 testing sites in the hardest hit zip codes across the state that are primarily zip codes where the majority of people who live there are people of color with, with who score high on the social vulnerability index due to the social determinants of health, which include comorbidities, lack of access to food and, and education resources, and also just frankly the systemic racism that has kept people down for far too long. So having these as inputs into the decisions, I believe that's quite different than what we've seen in the leadership in Michigan. And that's reflective of the diversity of the leadership team that we have in our state, not only with Governor Gretchen Whitmer and I, but also Dr. Jonay Caldoun, our chief medical executive. Um, we have the most diverse leadership team in the country uh, when it comes to responding to coronavirus. And I believe that is an opportunity for us to demonstrate the impact of that. What are you telling your kids? 
I mean, so my kids are, my twins are six and, and my baby girl will be one uh, on Juneteenth this month. And um, we're, we're letting them know that um, we just have to be careful. Um, right now, I think, you know, teaching kids good hand hygiene is never a bad thing. Um, but as to, in terms of the coronavirus, when it comes to the, to the demonstrations, um, we're telling them that people are, are outside and they're shouting because they want everybody to be treated fairly. Um, they don't want anyone to go outside and feel like they are in danger. And, and so they can see it. Um, they can see it from our window and, and stuff like that. And so they ask good questions and we show them the things on TV that aren't violent um, because the violence, frankly, is not representative of, of actually the spirit of the demonstration that will actually change. We don't show them that. We do show them what it means for people to speak out and speak up. And then I used to be a community organizer um, in the early part of my career, so they've actually seen this before, so it's not new to them. But we want to describe what it looks like here at home. One of the conversations that you're having now on a daily basis coming out of all the protests that we're seeing and people who are saying, look, now, now is time to have some different conversations than we have had before. You know, I've been um, really heartened that uh, leaders and law enforcement agencies across the state have reached out and wanting to be uh, supportive and productive and helpful and they have ideas. Uh, we've seen legislators who have already had legislation um, in the hopper that's looking to train, change standards for training and, and for, for police and, and law enforcement agencies. And community leaders feel like we have an opportunity at this generational moment uh, for more people to be engaged in this decision-making process. And so I think that we need to uh, really pounce upon this opportunity. And I think that this pandemic of COVID-19, um, this, this what has felt like ever present for my entire life and certainly for generations, uh, this stain of racism and oppression, we have the ability to, to address both of these at once in some way. And I believe that we can make progress on both. Let me ask you before I let you go about uh, opening this state up. All of a sudden, the announcement came yesterday, flurry of activity from people who feel all of a sudden that they're going to be able to go out and be about again. Um, what would you say in terms of either cautioning people or letting them still understand that we're still moving through this, even though much more is going to be opening up? The biggest thing is that the coronavirus, unfortunately, hasn't changed. It's still as contagious. It is still as deadly. We don't have an antiviral treatment. We don't have a vaccine. So people still need to be careful. While it is true that the, the, the public health data and the infrastructure and the testing capacity and the testing results have shown that we can move along our spectrum, our phased approach, we can do that. But we need to do so carefully. To be very clear, the safest thing you can do is stay home if you, can, if you don't have to leave. That is the safest thing you can do, unambiguously. But if you go out, people need to wear their masks. People need to social distance. People need to wash their hands. And, you know, frankly, in the, in the demonstrations, I haven't seen enough masks. I haven't seen enough social distancing. Um, we need to see more of that. So that does concern me. Like, you know, I, I'm worried about people who are going out and fighting and yearning and calling for justice, but putting themselves at risk in the midst of a global pandemic. So um, people need to be vigilant about that as well, um, because in order for us to continue advocating, we need to stay alive. All right, Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist, it's good to see you. We're going to continue to follow everything that happens here, and we appreciate your time. Thank you, Christy. Stay safe. It's good to see you. You too. You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter.